Thank you, and I'm certainly pleased to join you. I'm going to uh, try to do two things with uh, with the group in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. First is to talk about the interdependency of three strategies, if you will, that have been kicked around, price transparency, bundled pricing, and reference pricing. And really the context there is why have these things been so unsuccessful in moderating costs uh, and what can be done about it going forward. And then secondly, I'm going to briefly present some uh, evidence on effective reference pricing from a study we did in California, part of our ongoing work uh, in California. Okay, um, so what I uh, just start off with just the importance of pricing, and I actually think I'd like to define these first. First, reimbursement to me is that set prices are set to cover costs. In other words, the buyers have to pay what the providers charge. That's the point of pricing. Whereas in purchasing, prices don't cover costs, they determine costs. It's up to the providers to develop services that the buyers are willing to buy at a price that they're willing to pay. And that the larger context of healthcare payment is it's shifting from reimbursement to purchasing. And for this to be successful, prices need to have three characteristics. They need to be bundled and coherent. You know, we don't want to buy car parts, we want to buy cars. They need to be transparent. We need to know what we're going to, what we're going to be charged before we make our choice. And thirdly, consumers, we need to care about prices. In other words, we need to have the perception that we're spending our own money rather than somebody else's. Let's start with price transparency, which is, of course, right there next to the motherhood and apple pie, close to the heart of all Americans. We all believe in price transparency. We believe in informed consumer choice. This gives incentives for the providers to compete on price as well as quality, creates pressure to reduce prices. We, everything, we disclose everything on everything. Why not prices? And also in their current moment of time, with mobile technology, particularly uh, smartphones, we have the ability now to have prices um, at the point of decision and prices that affect us. For example, I don't care the price charged by a particular doctor that I'm not going to go to. I don't care about the price charged by that, the doctor that I am going to go to would be to somebody else, meaning that someone else is in a different insurance policy or someone else is at a different point in their deductible. I really just care about what I would have to pay if I go there. And price transparency, of course, is coming. There's a lot of disclosure mandates around there. Uh, and uh, this is one thing that the, that the legislature seem to be very uh, keen on. But let's just pause and just think a little bit on the challenges here. Making the current structure of prices, which are inscrutable and irrational, making them transparent is just going to reveal further how crazy things are up there. There's going to be some components of care which is simple enough that making the prices transparent is going to be okay. Like, you know, lazy guy surgery or um, maybe a um, a certain prescriptions it's going to be just tell me what it's going to cost me and I'll make my choice. But most health services are consumed as part of an episode of care and it's the episode price that really counts. When we go buy a car, we want to buy a car, we want to hear the price of the car, not the price of each of the components of the car. And so price transparency, if it's really going to be sensible, has to be accompanied by some kind of sensible bundling of the prices so that we know what the package of care that we're going to, and what's the price of that in provider A versus provider B, or product A versus product B. So now I want to move to bundle pricing. And I want to say, I and the Integrated Healthcare Association in California we've worked on this a lot. It has been very frustrating. This is where we start. Fragmented payment undermines incentives for everybody that's involved in healthcare to coordinate their activities and to improve efficiency. Moreover, the consumers can't act on all this fragmented prices, even if they were transparent. Um, we all sorts of good initiatives from Medicare and various private initiatives have really pioneered bundle payment for orthopedic surgery and a variety of other things, and it has been frustrating. Uh, this has been my experience. Well, first of all, the payers want savings from price bundling in the first year, but the providers want to maintain their income revenue, their revenue streams because they need to invest in a lot of infrastructure, IT, a lot of work internally. And they will only embrace bundle payment if it leads, in their view, to gains of more patients, or at least to avoid losing the patients that they have. But most of the bundle payment initiatives to date have not had any form of consumer cost-sharing component. In other words, there's no 
incentive for the patient to, to, to use a provider that offers bundle pricing rather than non-bundle pricing. And so frankly, my experience has been that out there in the real world, providers will, don't, are not rushing to adopt bundle, price, bundle pricing. They, if they're mandated by Medicare, they'll do it. Otherwise, they don't use the forms. And this takes us to cost sharing. Traditional forms of cost sharing don't influence consumer choice of really costly services. Annual deductibles typically target, by structure, low-cost preventive and primary care services, not high-cost specialty and hospital services, because those are all above the deductible. Coinsurance exposes the patient to only 20% or whatever the number is of the cost, and it's limited by an annual out-of-pocket maximum. Dollar copayments charge the same price to the consumer regardless of the price charged by the provider, and typically a small relative to the price of the specialty services. Now, you can do tiered copayments, and we've heard some nice uh, discussion of those, but as a general charging for someone $50 versus $150 for a hospital admission that's going to cost $20,000 is not really getting at the action. So versus pricing, it, which I'm going to talk about now, is one way of getting at that, and it's not the only way, but it's out there right now. What is reference price? The reference pricing, the sponsor, by which you mean the employee, self insured employee or the insurer, establishes a maximum contribution, which is called a reference price, kind of a lousy term, but it's really a contribution, that it will make towards the payment for a particular service or a particular product. And this contribution limit is set at either the minimum or the median of the range of prices charges charged by comparable providers in the comparable geographic market or therapeutic niche for like a drug. Then the patient must pay the full difference between the sponsor's contribution limit and the actual price that is paid to the provider, the negotiated price negotiated between the insurer and the provider. Uh, so the, the, the payer, the pa excuse me, the patient has to pay up, and uh, the, the patient pays 100% of the difference, not coinsurance, not 20%, and that patient payment is not limited by some sort of out-of-pocket maximum. So in short, the patient has very good coverage for the for the options that are at or below the sponsor's reference price, but has full responsibility for payment uh, for uh, going using services or products that charge prices above that. And to give a non-healthcare example, it's kind of like many of us travel on work, and our employer usually will have some sort of reference price on what they, what a per diem we call it, on what we can spend on meals. My employer pays up to $72 a day for all in, three meals plus miscellaneous. They, I can go to any restaurant I want, but they will pay up to $72, and after 72, 100% is out of my own pocket. There's no annual out-of-pocket maximum. It's not 20%, it's 100%, everything above 72, end of discussion. Okay, now what about the challenges to reference pricing? Of course, this is limited. Placing financial responsibility for price conscious choice onto the consumer is inappropriate if the prices are confidential, they're unavailable, unavailable or just simply it's so complicated no one can understand. Of course, consumers also need whatever is available on in terms of quality data on outcomes, processes, et cetera, in order to compare price with performance. And we've made a lot of, we in the U.S. put a lot of effort into collecting data on quality and satisfaction, and actually we have better data for that often than on price data. So this, this can go in full circle here, and then my, my point up to right now is that price transparency to work needs bundle pricing. Bundle pricing to work needs reference pricing, in other words, consumer incentives. For, for, and then reference pricing needs price transparency. So it's a circle. These three things are interdependent. And realistically, if we're going to make real progress, we have to make progress on, on all three of these. Now, I want to tell you, say a little bit more about what is reference pricing and a little bit of the evidence today. Uh, reference pricing is best applied to products and services where there's a wide variation in price and the patients can, so to speak, shop. They have time to compare options, and it's been used most heavily for drugs in Europe where the single-payer systems, they set up a particular price within a therapeutic category for what they'll pay for a type of drug, and the patient has to pay anything above that reference price the patient pays. It's been applied to laboratory tests and diagnostic imaging such as MRI, CT, 
uh, here in the States. It's been applied to scheduled non-emergency surgery uh, here, both inpatient and ambulatory. It, the purchasers in the States are increasingly concerned, as you know, with hospital consolidation uh, and the effect of other prices, and also to the indifference of consumers to prices. Um, and the, the traditional managed care strategy of uh, bargaining low prices with providers really doesn't seem to be working very well anymore because the providers are consolidated, there's inadequate supply of many specialties in many markets, and prices simply are going up. Here's a study that we did in California. Uh, reference pricing was pioneered by CalPERS. CalPERS is the public employee's retirement system in California. It offers health insurance as well as pensions to about 1.3 million Californians, employees, dependents, and retirees of the state and other public entities like school districts. Uh, about 450,000 of those are in its self-insured PPO, the remainder being in a couple of HMO options. This discussion is all about PPO. And it, it saw in its data that it was paying about between $20,000 and $120,000 for the same procedures, in other words, hip and knee replacement procedures in different hospitals across the state without any evidence that the higher prices were associated with higher quality. Um, a few years ago, as you know, the state of California almost went bankrupt. Uh, there was uh, very little um, sympathy out there for this kind of behavior. Um, and the, the, the capital had to moderate its rate of expenditure growth, and it was either going to do reference pricing or it was going to move everybody to high deductible health plans. It's heavily unionized workforce. The unions chose reference pricing over high deductible. They chose, uh, they set this rate at $30,000, which uh, got about 50 hospitals. Uh, Charged less than 50, less than 30,000, were nicely geographically dispersed across the state and scored as well as or better than the average uh, in terms of the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, quality metrics on orthopedic surgery. Um, and PERS then initiated an employee communication strategy, a very elementary transparency strategy, which basically was one of here's the list of the hospitals we suggest you go to. If you want to go to the other hospitals, you can, but you're going to pay more yourself. I just want to contrast this, by the way, to a narrow network strategy. Reference pricing is, is a broad network strategy. It is not that you can go, you can go to any hospital, but you're going to pay more if you go, and how much more depends on how much they charge. So it's really up to the hospital how much they want to charge you, and, and then and you're, you're the consumer, you get to pick which hospital. The hospital gets to choose what it's going to charge. We're not controlling either of those things, but we, PERS, are controlling how much we will pay. Uh, this is just a graphic. This is the range of prices for knee and hip that they were charging. Each of these little bars is a hospital. So it's the average price charged to CalPERS. These are 2009 data prior to reference pricing. You just see this range uh, of incredible range. For, it's really a pretty commodity surgical procedure, knee and hip replacement, scheduled non-emergency. Um, so what happened? Uh, at the beginning of 2010, they put in reference pricing, and what you see is this is what happened. This is choice of, of hospital. The red lines are the uh, CalPERS data, and the blue lines, we had a control group of Anthem Blue Cross, uh, PPO enrollees who were not subject to uh, reference pricing, uh, and the dotted lines are uh, the market shares of uh, the lower cost hospitals uh, called value-based purchasing design hospitals. That's a great CalPERS euphemism, meaning low price. Uh, and the solid lines are the high price. And, and the punchline is on the red line, the, the solid red line goes down very significantly uh, after January 2010, and the dotted one goes up. Whereas for the Anthem people not subject to reference pricing, there's not any change. Nothing's happening in particular out there in the market. They're just doing their thing. Uh, so that's, first of all, changing market share towards lower-priced hospitals. Frankly, this is a little bit surprising to me because I was impressed that the market share of the high-priced hospital didn't go to zero, given patients would be uh, at risk for paying a um, very meaningful uh, out-of-pocket sum. But this is what happened to the prices. Next slide is this one. This is the price charged to PERS before national reference pricing. Remember, again, the red lines are the PERS and the blue lines are the control group. And what you see is that prior to reference pricing, prices were going up. This is America. Prices go up in healthcare. 
But then after reference pricing for the PERS, there was a very significant reduction in the average price. What it was was about half of the hospitals that were high priced above 30,000 uh, made very meaningful reductions in their prices. The other half just let the patients go. Um, and there was uh, no big effect in any of the other um, in the control group. And so it was this reduction in prices that really maintained the market share for the formerly high-priced hospitals. They really faced the classic trade-off, do we want to have a high-priced, low-volume, or lower-priced, higher-volume? And different hospitals uh, pursued different strategies, and this was the big effect, I mean, the big uh, trend. And um, the effect on PERS was really as follows. Um, the reference pricing did induce enrollees to, to disproportionately shift to lower priced facilities compared to pre-reference pricing, but the bigger effect actually was on hospital prices. Per saved $6 million in two years just from this, this particular procedure. It's now extending reference pricing to ambulatory surgical uh, facilities. We're in the midst of study of that. Um, other services, reference pricing uh, is likely to affect consumer choice, but probably not the prices. Uh, we're doing a study with Safeway on lab and imaging. Um, and what's amazing about, the, what's striking about these is that we have really elementary transparency, but transparency tools are dramatically improving out there now. Uh, Safeway, PERS, others now working with various different kinds of specialty tech firms on transparency strategies. And here is uh, the bottom is the health affairs paper if you're interested in more details of the study. So I'm going to wrap up here and um, not to say that any of this is a panacea for anything. The limits of price transparency, um, but it does, it's very limited, but it does support patients as shoppers and it's consistent with a larger culture of sunshine and Facebook. Uh, but to really transform healthcare, Price transparency requires some form of bundle payment, coherent payment, and reference pricing. Secondly, bundle, bundle pricing is a good thing. It gives incentives to doctors and hospitals to work together. That's its great virtue for efficiency and cost reduction. And it allows the payers to compare price with performance. We can have a little bit of a sensible uh, trade-off there. Uh, but to transform healthcare, it really requires some sort of reference pricing or some sort of consumer uh, incentive so that the consumers choose those hospitals and also transparency so they can really understand those. And finally, the limit to reference pricing. It does help convert shop, uh, patients into shoppers. It does help stimulate price competition among providers. But, it, but if it's really going to be extended, it does require more transparency of prices and more coherent prices for complicated procedures as we move beyond fairly simple things like joint replacement and lab imaging as we move into more complex uh, chronic care it would require more and more bundling of services. I want to leave it at that and say thank you.